Won't you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you that you've given us breath today, Lord God, to celebrate you, to sing your praises, Lord, to encourage one another, God, to pray for one another. Lord, what a wonderful gift that is, one, one that we often take for granted. And so, Father, we just want to stop and say thank you. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for your word. God, speak to us today. Let us not leave here the same way we walked in, but God, let us leave with more than just knowledge. God, let us leave with life change. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is great, great to see you this morning. And today we are kicking off a new series. You know, I don't know if you know this, but in eight weeks, uh, eight weeks from today, we're going to be celebrating Easter. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's like already there. Um, and, and so we thought about, you know, what's the best way to lead up into Easter? You know, typically in February we do a relationship series or something along those lines. But, but this um, next seven weeks, I really wanted to do something a little bit different. We just wrapped up a series called Simplify, and we looked at how we should simplify our lives, how God really lays it out for us. And, and it means so much to us, especially as we get older, things become more and more complex. And so just to know that God has called us to uh, simplicity, not to easiness, but, but really to simplicity by obeying and following after his word. And if you missed any of that, you can um, find those sermons online. If you have your uh, cell phone with you today, you can download our mobile app and you'll not only find those sermons, but you'll find notes for today. But over the next seven weeks, I wanted to dive into a, a little bit different uh, gear than what we normally run in. Uh, and I wanted us to look specifically at these feasts that were in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they, they celebrated, they, they, um, at, by the command of God, they, they had these feasts each and every year at certain times throughout the year. And there were seven of them. And as we go into these seven weeks uh, before Easter, I thought, what, what a neat thought to begin to look at how these Old Testament feasts really began to point the way to Jesus. And how Jesus really is the subject. And what better way to celebrate him on eight weeks from today as we celebrate Easter than to really begin to look at how the whole entire Bible and especially these feasts of the Old Testament, how they really point towards Christ and point towards the Messiah and point towards our freedom in him. And so we, we kind of look at this and, and this idea, this thought, this series really comes from uh, the chapel, which is a ministry up in uh, New York. There's, I think there's, they've got about three campuses up there. But as I was lo looking and researching this, I, I came across uh, these guys and, and I just I fell in love with this thought, fell in love with this series and, and really wanted to share it with you over the next seven weeks. Well, today we're going to look at probably the most famous feast uh, within the Jewish calendar, whether you're Jewish or not. Um, we know of this feast. We've heard of this feast. And, and it's not one that, that maybe we, we haven't heard of yet today. But I believe it's one that really focuses um, and kicks us off in the right direction as it looks towards Jesus Christ. And it's the Passover. The Passover. For the, for the Israelites, uh, this was something very specific as they, they called and they still do call this feast the Feast of Freedom. And if you're not quite sure where this comes from in Scripture, and as we see even Jesus celebrating the Passover meal, uh, his uh, last moments before the crucifixion, as we see this time period and we see how long the Jewish people celebrated uh, this feast, we find it first in Exodus chapter 11. I want you to turn there with me. Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 and following. And, and you may remember uh, the story of the Israelites. You know, if you, ha if you haven't read the story, you've probably seen the movie right? uh, of their exodus out of Egypt. And, and this, this whole idea that, you know, as, as Joseph was taken into captivity and he found himself into Egypt and all of a sudden he, he not only saves the Egyptian people, but he saves his own family uh, by his interpretation of the dreams, by all of the ways in which God was working in his life throughout the Old Testament. And then the, this nation began to grow. And these Israelites began to become numerous in number and they began to be enslaved by the Egyptian people. And they, they found themselves enslaved for uh, over 400 years. And we find this in verse 4, chapter, Exodus chapter 11, verse 4. It says this, so Moses says, and Moses has entered on the scene. Moses' story is pretty familiar. We won't dive into Moses today. But, and Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. 
Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So, so Moses begins to, to tell what this plague and you know, the ten plagues that came upon Egypt as they would uh, ask permission. And you know, if the story, Moses didn't think he was the right man for the job and didn't think he spoke well enough for the job. And, and so God sent him with his, with his brother and they approached Pharaoh and they, they, they are asking him to let their people go. And he would say yes, and then he would change his mind. Then he would say yes, and he would change his mind. And, and there was plagues that would begin to come, and there was frogs, and there was gnats. And, and some of us are reading through the year as a, as a corporate Bible study. If you'd like to do that, uh, you can find that group. Ask me about that group. We'll get you connected. It's with the Bible app. And, um, but I love what Wesley said. He said, you know, I would have stopped at the gnats. Like as soon as the gnats plague, it's like, okay, just go, right? We hate gnats. But, but he didn't stop at the gnats, right? There was other things that took place until it uh, culminated to this final plague, this, this killing of the firstborn. And that seems very, very harsh when you're reading the Old Testament. But as we look at the Old Testament, especially in Genesis chapter 12, we, we see something interesting in verse 3. God's promise, his covenant to Abraham. Here's what he said. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. And we find that, that God has, has stated in the very beginning with this covenant with Abraham, with the Israelite people, that whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And then we see something very also very interesting to me is that, that when you look at this, this, this terrible thing that took place in Egypt on that day, we have to remember back to when Moses was born. Remember when Moses was born? Moses was born in great turmoil as the Israelites were in captivity of Egypt. And in fact, the Pharaoh had given this command because the Israelites were becoming too numerous in number that, that he said, kill every male child that's born, throw them into the Nile. And so a mass murdering of many of the Israelite children and only Moses was saved because of the basket in the Nile. And we see that God's word is true and we see that his justice is real. And in Exodus chapter 12, after all of these things has been spoken and after the Pharaoh has been made known what will take place if, if the people have not been let go, and every chance after chance after chance after chance has been taken, we find this in 12 verse 1. It said, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel, that on the 10th day of this month, month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are determined the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats." Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all of the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water but roast it over a fire with the head, legs and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your coat tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. We see God gives Moses and Aaron these very specific commands about this Passover meal. 
I mean, not only how they were to prepare the meal, but how were they were to choose the meal in the first place. And there's this, this, this waiting period, you know, as they bring in the lamb, that they were supposed to live with the lamb for four days. And, and this, this getting to know the lamb and making sure that it is free without defect. And then how to cook the lamb and how to eat the lamb and even what to wear to the meal. Right. I mean, this is just an amazing, uh, you know, look at uh, all of the details in which God is giving the Israelite people. And as he's letting them know, he's saying that this this will be, you know, kind of a judgment against all of the gods of Egypt. And what we find is that when you study the plagues, it really was just that. That, that as God was was you, God just didn't pick these plagues you know, out of the wild. He, he really let them be specific to the gods in which Egypt worshipped to prove once and for, for, for all for the Egypt people. For the Egyptian people, that God is God. Not the gods that they worship, but that there is one true God. And in fact, this Passover meal was going to be the culmination of that. Because as you study Egyptian culture and as you study the Passover and as you study all of these things, I love the things that have been brought out of this passage by so many people much wiser than I. But one of the things that they bring out is that one of the main gods of Egypt was the god of Ammon. And that when you see his picture in different, um, you know, hieroglyphics and different things, he's either pictured with a lamb or he's pictured as a ram. And so there's this whole idea that the lamb of God, that the lamb that God has chosen for his people is going to be greater than any other lamb. It's going to be greater than any other God because he is God and all others are false. What we find as we look at this, this meal is that from the very beginning, the lamb is God's centerpiece for the deliverance of his people. Everything was focused around the lamb. There were other parts of this meal, but the main part of the meal, the main part that had to be eaten completely or completely burned, that part of the meal, everything that surrounded it was all surrounding the lamb. It was this God's centerpiece. He was going to deliver them. There was going to be this great plague that went throughout the kingdom. But if they had the blood over their door frame, if they, if they had done what God had called them to do, then they were going to be delivered. The, the angel was going to pass over their house. And we find that as scripture, as we read and as we're going to learn today, that nothing has changed. That the lamb is still God's centerpiece for the deliverance of God's people. You know, as we dive into Old Testament today, there, you know, sometimes we, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to kind of skip over the Old Testament and just begin to look at the life of Jesus. And Jesus is the subject, as we've talked about. But, but I think we, we, we do ourselves a great disservice if we don't understand how God connects both the Old Testament and the New Testament. How this wasn't just a different God. You know, I've, I've heard people say, well, there's the God of the Old and the God of the New. No, there's just one God. <laughs> and He is Yahweh, and He is, he is the God over all. And as we look at this, this idea of the Old Testament and the New Testament, what I find so comforting in this is that God had a plan from the very beginning. And as you, as you look at the Israelite people and as you put ourselves in their shoes, because come on, we, we love great stories, but, but at the end of the day, how does it affect us? In fact, some of you are probably asking, that's great. They celebrated a feast. How does that help me tomorrow when I go to work? How does that help my marriage how does that help my financial situation? Because I love these stories, or maybe I don't really love the stories. I pretend I love the stories, but I just want to know, is God real and does he even care? And what I love about recognizing through the Old Testament that it all points to Christ is that God had a plan from the beginning and that nothing was not thought through. And that as we look, that, that, that we just, we just think of the Israelites and, and their, their life through those 400 years and, and, and just the, the cries that they would cry out to God. And it says that God heard those cries and he began to put a plan in place and he began to orchestrate all of these things. And he had Joseph's brothers turn on him and so they would sell him into slavery and he finds himself into, into Egypt. And then he gave Joseph the ability to kind of interpret these dreams and, and to have the ability to find favor not only in the eyes of God, but the eyes of men. And he began to put this plan in place. All why? Because God cares about his people. And so we come to this Passover meal, this very specific way in which they were to prepare it, the way in which they were to dress, the way in which they were even to eat it. Any of you know fast eaters? 
Some of you love to lounge when you eat. Others of you, this is like every day. The Passover meal would be like, you're, just, you're always just, you know, coming in. I remember my grandfather, I was always amazed at the way he, fat, the speed in which he ate. And I asked him one time, I said, Papa, why do you eat so fast? He said, I don't know. I picked it up in the army and it never left, right? We only had a certain amount of time to eat. And so, so he would just like right there and we'd just shovel it in and then he'd talk. But you didn't talk when he was eating. You know, he just, you know, he was there. The people ate this meal in haste. Exodus 12, 1. As we look, look at these scriptures, actually verse 7, I love this. It says, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. You say, what, why? What's so special about the blood? I mean, wasn't it enough to be God's people, God's chosen people? I mean, wasn't that enough? Well, it wasn't enough to just have this meal and to, to dress the way that God wanted you to dress, to eat the way that God wanted you to eat. I mean, wasn't that enough just to show that you were God's and that he was yours and that, that you believed and had faith in God? And, and so why, why, why all the thought process and, and, and the mess, really, of, of blood over the door? Have you ever thought about that? Well, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says this, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And in fact, we see when Cain killed Abel that, that you know, God spent time talking about uh, the blood that was shed. And what we find is that as we read through the Old Testament scriptures and as we, we read through the, the sacrificial system that God would put in place for the Israelites, that blood is God's ordained currency for life. That because life is in the blood, that, that, that God you know, helps us to begin to understand that, that blood must be shed. Why? Because blood is collected to, to life. And so that as they shed the lamb's blood and as they put it over the door, there was something very powerful there. And, and why would they put it on the door? You know, I mean, there's a lot of different interpretations. I love what the pastors at the chapel said, you know, that, that there's, there's different reasons. And in fact, as you, you look at that, I mean, you have it on each door frame and then you have it on the top. There's very powerful symbolism there, is there not? And in fact, you have Jesus himself saying in John chapter 10, verse 9, in the New King James, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There's powerful symbolicness about blood being on the door frames of the house and on the headboard. Why was it not on the baseboard? I love what one scholar said. He said, because in Hebrews, we understand the very severity of trampling over the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we look at the scripture today, we realize that those who did this, who not only took the time to choose an unblemished lamb, who not only took the time over the next four days to, to look at the lamb, to, to inspect the lamb, and to really understand the gravity of their sin, sin through the lamb. Because what happens when you bring an animal inside the house? It becomes a pet. It's no longer an animal, is it? Right? I mean, there, there's a lots of things I see outside. I'm not bringing them in because I know you bring them in, they're, they're going to be a pet. It doesn't even matter what it is. I mean, some people I've seen, you know, we've got YouTube now. We've got, you know, incredible knowledge. <laughs> and I've seen people, they'll bring cows into the house. I mean, cows and they're pets now. It's like, when did that happen? You know, I just like, don't tell Bella, okay? Because, but there's just something amazing that happens when you bring a, some, an animal that lives outside, when you bring it inside, there's this connection that begins to take place. And it had to have taken place for this family. I mean, think of it. These families had kids. These families had those who would, I mean, all of a sudden the lamb is in the house. Woo! I mean, this is great, right? Most studies say that they would name the lamb, not Fluffy or, you know, the names that we would name the lamb, but that they would put the, the family's name on the lamb. So that if in any way that the lamb got out, everyone would know whose lamb that was, that it could be returned. Why? Because they had spent time finding a spotless lamb. We see that all of those who did this, all of those who went through all of this ritual, all of those who prepared their hearts for what God was about to do, who took the time to not only prepare the meal and to eat it the way that God had said, but to put the blood upon the door, that all of those who did this were passed over from judgment. And those who didn't, judgment fell on their house. 
And it's a powerful thing as you read through the book of Exodus that just what God said would happen, happened. That the next morning, all of those who had put the blood upon the door of their households had been spared, but all of those who hadn't suffered loss. As we look at the obvious connection to Jesus, we find in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that prophecy that we often read around Christmas time. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. And then we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, this fulfillment says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So for our hundreds and hundreds of years, the Israelites have gone through this Passover feast each and every year. Each and every year on the 10th day, they would find a lamb. Each and every year for four days, they would keep that lamb in their house. Each and every year on the fourth day, they would sacrifice the lamb. They would uh, cook the lamb in the way it was supposed to be cooked. They would eat the lamb the way it was supposed to be eaten. They, They would go through this each and every year to remember what God had done, that he had saved them as a people because of their obedience and their faith in God, that he had passed over their house. And so they would celebrate this Passover meal. Now, you you know that that the Israelites were multitudes of people. And so so if you have multitudes of people and you have multitudes of families, that's a lot, a lot of lambs. And actually in Micah chapter 4, we we read about the the idea that that as the Savior is getting ready to be proclaimed, that this this whole idea of of looking at Jerusalem and and looking at um, the... the, um, The the sheeps and the lambs that are really required for this type of of sacrifice. And as most scholars believe that as you look at at Bethlehem and its surrounding areas, that 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 surrounding area, and, and this is maybe not new information for some of you, but this is very powerful information for all of us. That that surrounding area would be where they kept the Passover lambs, where they they began to, I mean, if you're doing this every year, all of a sudden you know it's coming. It's like Christmas, you know it's coming, so you prepare for it. And so if we're going to have to have spotless lambs on the Passover, then then let's get together and let's make sure that we have spotless lambs. And so there was this whole shepherds that they would take care of these these priesthood lambs, these these lambs that would be sacrificed on Passover. And most scholars believe that as the, the shepherds were there in the fields right outside of Bethlehem where all of these things would have been taken care of, would have been taking place as regards to taking care of the lambs, that they hear this proclamation that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. You say, well, why, why would that be a sign? I mean, I mean don't, don't you find babies wrapped in cloths? <laughs> I mean, maybe not lying in a manger, but what's so special about that sign? Well, many scholars believe that as they were washing over Passover lambs, as they were taking care of those herds and and looking after those herds, they were always on watch because whenever they would begin to give birth, they would be there to help. Because you don't want one that's defective. You don't want one that's out of complication, is not born properly. And so so they would be careful to, to take care of those newborn lambs. And they would wrap the lambs in cloths. And they had manger there in the fields that they would take care of the men. And so as the shepherds are hearing this great news, and as they're going to see the coming Messiah, don't think for a moment that the symbolism was lost upon them. That as shepherds who take care of the Passover lambs, that as the Messiah has been born, the lamb who will be slain for all, that the way that we will find him is the very way in which we take care of those lambs wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Scripture goes on to say this in John chapter 1, verse 29. As Jesus' ministries begins, 
as, as Jesus is coming into his ministry, it says this, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That as Jesus is first coming and, and, and John the Baptist is baptizing, because that's where you get the name. <laughs> and as he's baptizing those, and we're going through this in Bible study right now on Wednesday nights, as he's baptizing those, he looks up and he sees Jesus. And he, and he just takes this moment. I mean, just surrounded by people, people probably in the water waiting to get baptized. And he turns their focus, their attention upon Jesus. And he says this, look, look. And everyone turns to look. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. In that moment, John and Jesus know what Jesus' purpose is here on earth. In that moment, John and Jesus are the only ones in this crowd who begin to really, who really understand what that phrase that John says means that God has chosen a lamb to overcome the sins of this world. And so we see Jesus as his ministry begins and over the next three years, he's in and out of Jerusalem and every, he's always celebrating the Passover and they're doing these things because that's what they do because they're Jewish. <laughs> And he's going throughout and, and he's having different encounters with different people and he's fulfilling all of these prophecies. And then we have this one special day in Jerusalem. It wasn't Jesus' first day in Jerusalem, but it's this one special day in Jerusalem when Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. And as he's preparing to go to the cross, he enters at this time of Passover. And in fact, as he's entering into on, on what we would call Palm Sunday, right? I mean, the, because the branches and the hosannas and all of these type of things that they would be pre presenting and laying down before God. As he's entering into Jerusalem on this specific day, this day for everyone else in town would be lamb selection day for the Passover that they would be selecting the Passover lamb for their families and for, for, for their kinfolk to come in and to eat the Passover just as they've been you know, doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's on this day that Jesus comes and enters into Jerusalem. Just the amazing timing of God, the fulfillment of Scripture through God, that as the Passover lamb, as the ultimate lamb that God would give, that he would choose and he would pick out, that the ultimate lamb, that it would come into Jerusalem on this selection day. <laughs> you see, Jesus understood this. In fact, while they're eating the Passover meal, it says in verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup when he had given thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the, sin, for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. And so we have Jesus, he's entering into this Passover time. He's entering into Jerusalem. And, and then what we find is that he's, he's brought to the temple for trial, right? And he's brought before Pilate himself for trial. And there's this amazing symbolism of what God is doing for his people and preparing them for salvation in the way in which he did in Egypt. He's preparing his people today because as, as Jesus is being mocked and he's being ridiculed and he's being called everything but pure. Remember what Jesus was called? He was called a heretic. You know, that, that he was claiming things about God and all and about the temple and all of these type of things and that all of the accusations were against him. In fact, if, if he was the lamb, we would say he's not spotless. Everyone in the crowd would say he's blemished. Give us Barabbas. But yet it's Pilate. And I don't know why the phrasing of this word, but I mean, just in just God's sovereignty, here's what Pilate says to the people. It says in verse six, as soon as the chief priest and their officials saw them, saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. If you want to take the lamb and crucify him, you do that. But as for me, I see him as spotless. 
as blemish free. As you put him on trial and as you've tested him and as you, you would have tested your lamb for the last four days, making sure that he was without blemish and without fault and it was perfect purity to be able to offer up to God as a Passover meal. As I look at this man, Jesus, I find no offense in him. It's this powerful example. Powerful symbolism of the, the purity of Jesus Christ as God's chosen lamb. Why would he not be pure? God chose him. He picked him out. God brought him for that very reason. To be the atoning sacrifice for us. To be the one whose blood would be spread over our doorposts if we would allow it. And to be one who the, the death angel would pass over. Death would no longer harm us. Because of the blood that is over us and covers us. You see what I find oftentimes. And what I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is, as we look at our lives, we have to begin to realize this, that we need to choose our lamb carefully. We need to choose our lamb carefully. Because you see, there's a temptation to, to choose other lambs in our life. There's a temptation, as we talked about a few months, a few weeks ago, to, to put our finances ahead of God. You know, there's a temptation to say, you know, these things will save me. My relationships with others will save me or my relationship with money will save me or my status in the world will save me. And none of those things will save us. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we are saved. And so if we make our lamb any other thing, if we, if we sacrifice our life for any other thing, then we lose out on the salvation that is available to us through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. So we have to choose our lamb. In fact, Scripture says this, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that it was not, without, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God, you know, the, Peter says, look, it, we, it's not something that we purchased. It was only through God's shedding of his son's blood through this lamb that was slain for us, that we have life and life abundantly. So we have to choose our lamb carefully. Secondly, and I, I love this thought. This isn't original to me. I just love it. We have to be careful not to make Jesus your pet. As I first read that, I thought, well, what does that even mean? And then begin to look at the Israelites' life, and I begin to look at what would have happened and the temptation that could have been there. Because you bring a pet into your, you bring an animal into your home, it becomes a pet. And pretty soon you don't want it for what it was meant for. You want it for what it kind of gives to you. A little bit of comfort. A little bit of joy. And the temptation if you have a lamb in your home. You know, it wasn't the having the lamb in your home that saved you, was it? It wasn't cooking the lamb the way God called you to cook it that saved. It, it, it wasn't eating the man in the way in which God told you to eat. No, none of those things, all of those things were necessary, but, but none of them were, were stood alone. It was the blood upon the doorpost that God says, when I look over, I will see you and identify you as those who are mine. And you see, oftentimes in our life, we want Jesus in our house. We just don't want him to be the sacrifice for us. We want him there to comfort us when we feel sad and we want him there to help us out when we need help and we want him there to get us the job because we need the job, but we don't want him to be Lord of our life. We don't want to put him in the position that he is there to be in. And what I love is that God does all of those things. He comforts us when we're sad. He, he gives us blessings beyond blessings, but, but there's a reason why he is there and we can't ever forget that because in forgetting that, we have a tendency to forget the gravity of our sin. That we can't do this on our own. That's why we need a Savior. Each and every one of us, God calls us sinners. That we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we have any hope of being saved. Don't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter the life that you live. Doesn't matter the family that you're brought up with. Unless we're underneath the, the blood of Jesus Christ, our home is unprotected. Scripture says this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, 
the enemy, Satan, the devil, of our brothers and sisters who accuses him before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by what? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. God says that the accuser has been accusing them day and night and that the only way that they triumphed over him was not by their good works alone, not by their, their, their family alone, not by their riches that they've accumulated on earth, but by the blood of the lamb. You want to know how to overcome the enemy in your life. It's by the blood of the lamb over your life. It's the only hope for us. You see, we live in a day and an age where we have a lot of tips and a lot of tricks and a lot of mannerisms in which we can kind of get ahead in life. And a lot of people who will give us great advice on how to better our finances and better our relationships and all of the things that we've talked about. But if it's not focused underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, they're all in vain. We can gain our life, but we, we can lose our soul. And for some of you here today, as you look at your life and as you look at these stories, you may think, you know what? <laughs> That's great, but I really don't need that. In fact, things are, for me are going pretty good. I mean, I've got the job or I had the job and I've got a retirement or now I'm in retirement. My kids are doing pretty good. I mean, got my friends. We like to do what we like to do and, and life is going pretty good. Well, so it's a great story. And I can appreciate symbolism as much as the next guy. But it really doesn't apply to me. And to that I would say the only hope we have is in the blood of the Lamb in Jesus Christ. You know, as we look at our life, What I believe is so powerful about looking at the feast in which the Israelites focused on was that for them, this was something that they had experienced firsthand. I mean, to go from slavery to freedom, to, to go from death to life, to, to, to understand what you have been saved from, it does something to you. And maybe for us, maybe we just don't realize the gravity of our sin. Maybe we just don't realize what it is that God is saving us from. Maybe when we look at our life, we don't really understand the blood of Jesus Christ and how powerful it is to all of those who would believe. Because I think when we begin to understand and just get a taste and a hint of what God has saved us from, and when we look honestly at ourselves in the mirror, come on, when you look at the mirror, do you really say, you know what, you're not such a bad guy? Or do you look at the mirror and say, you remember and I know? what you've done. And maybe no one else does, but you know. And maybe everyone else thinks you've got it all together, but you and I know you have not got it together. You see, when we find ourselves in those moments, we think, God, what hope is there for me? And it's the glorious, the good news of Jesus Christ. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That as believers in him, that we've put the blood upon the doorframe, upon the mantle of our house, and we've said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that we live according to those things. We don't forget them. It's not something that we did once. The, the, the Jewish people did this every single year as a remembrance for them. And as a lesson for those who would come after them. For some of us, this took place a long time ago when we were eight, when we were six, when we were 13. It's been years ago. But we need to remember the sacrifice that God has made in our life, not just for us, so that other people in our life know what God has done for us. So that they would follow in and paint the same blood upon their doorposts and say, I want to be one whose house is saved. I want to be one who is passed over. I want to be one who God looks upon and knows is his child. Church, that only comes through confession and through repentance and through a belief in Jesus Christ. I believe that this truth 
And my desire for us today, and as we dive into this series, that this truth, this truth about the blood of Jesus Christ, that it would empower you, that it would embolden you, and that it would encourage you. Because if God had this much detail into your life up to this point, do you think he stopped? <laughs> or is he not continuing to work out a plan that's so marvelous and great, even you can't think, dream, or imagine what he's up to? You see, God, was from the very beginning, he was getting his salvation plan in order so that it would affect you and I. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. And that if we would begin to realize and understand that to the power and the, the, the depth of that thought, that we would realize in those deep moments, in those dark moments, in those discouraging moments, God has not forgotten you. He has not left you, but he is here and he is working in your life. And we can't see it right now because we're surrounded by this world. But don't doubt for a moment that just because we can't see that God is not moving. See, just when it gets foggy doesn't mean that, that God isn't still there. Just means you can't see as clearly. And we all go through the fog, don't we? I was preparing for today and I, I came across this song. I just wept this morning in my kitchen. <laughs> Because I thought, God, I just, how oftentimes I just overlook these things in your word and I don't continue to go back and to go deeper into these things because I think I know. <laughs> but God, help me to never underestimate the blood of Jesus Christ. God, help me to, to never take it for granted. Lord, help me to always be remembering it for what you've done and for who you are. And not just for me, but for my family. And so this morning as we conclude, I wanted to do this for you because I don't know if this song will impact you the way it impacted me, but I just sat there crying today. And I just thought, God, if there's nothing else that we can say as a church, as a people, I mean, we can help people financially, we can help people physically, we can show up and be there, and I think we should do all of those things. But we can't forget what can truly bring healing in your life. We can't forget what can bring salvation in your life. We can't forget why we're here in the first place. And it's to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah and that it's his blood that he wants to cover us in. So that God views us not in our sin, but he views us through his sacrifice. So guys, just play this song for me if you would. And the words are on the screen. If you want to sing, you can sing. If you just want to sit and listen, you can listen. If you want to pray, you're welcome to come and pray. But if nothing else, can we just not celebrate what God has done and give him thanks for his sacrifice for saving us because we weren't worthy of it? And yet just by the act of making him Lord, he's passed over. So let's sing about that. Let's pray about that. Let's celebrate that today.
don't you stand with me this morning? Thank you for your blood. I want to ask Wayne to come and just to, to lead us in a simple song as we sing. I want to invite you to continue to pray, continue to celebrate, continue to ask God to be Lord over you. Let's sing. <laughs>